On June 8, 2023, an experimental submersible named Titan set off with five passengers on a trip to view the sunken wreck of the Titanic. The sub's creator, a company by the name of OceanGate, had made a name for themselves promising a one-of-a-kind exotic journey to see the wreckage of the world's most famous ship firsthand. The Titan sub was a vision of its founder, CEO Stockton Rush. Stockton had created OceanGate in 2009, with a belief that he was going to revolutionize the submersible industry by creating a vessel that could reach the deepest depths of the ocean, yet was affordable to build, easy to operate, and could quickly be upscaled to a fleet of vessels for a variety of commercial uses. In 2021, the company began offering private tours to the Titanic's wreckage, and today Stockton himself would be accompanying one such trip. At 9.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, the sub began its descent, communicating with its launch ship, the Polar Princess, every 15 minutes via a text messaging system. However, after 11.15 a.m., these messages stopped. You might think this would be cause for immediate concern and that some sort of emergency procedures would be undertaken. But as we'll see in this video, OceanGate's approach to the complex and technical world of deep sea exploration was unorthodox, to put it mildly. The crew continued waiting until 4.30 p.m. when the Titan was supposed to emerge. When it failed to do so, they waited an additional three hours before contacting the U.S. Coast Guard at 7.30 p.m. Over the next few days, a massive search was undertaken for the vessel, involving hundreds of rescue workers from multiple countries as they raced in hopes of finding the Titan before its 96 hours of backup air ran out. As the search intensified and the case gained media attention, the inner workings of OceanGate were placed under a public microscope. What came to light was a shocking tale of a company whose ambition had far exceeded its common sense. A company that, in its crusade to do for submarines what Tesla had done for the electric car and Amazon for e-commerce, had created an environment where safety was an afterthought and disaster became inevitable. A belief system that started right at the top with its founding father and would ultimately cost Stockton Rush his life and the lives of four others. Stockton Rush was an entrepreneur from a wealthy California family. Growing up, he was an avid scuba diver and airplane enthusiast. After getting an aerospace engineering degree from Princeton and a master's degree in business administration from Berkeley, Stockton moved to Washington State to run the Kirkland-based remote technology company, where he would stay for the next 20 years. Rush originally wanted to get into the aerospace industry, but soon turned his gaze back to Earth, where he developed a fascination for the deep ocean in the early 2000s. Rush purchased his first submersible just after founding OceanGate. It was a small vessel built in 1973 by Perry Submarines called the Antipodes. Certified to operate at depths of 1,000 feet with cabin room for five people, it was a fine vessel with a strong track record of performance. The purpose of it, though, was to serve as a training device for the OceanGate team while they worked on plans for their own submersible. OceanGate began work on their first sub named the Cyclops-1. Throughout the design process, the goal was to make a sub that could dive deep into the ocean and was relatively inexpensive to make. One of the ideas OceanGate had come up with in their early days was chartering private submersible dives to the Titanic. This topic was pretty close to Stockton's heart. His wife Wendy is the great-granddaughter of Isidore and Ida Strauss, who lost their lives on the Titanic and are probably best remembered today for the scene in the film where the old couple lay in bed together as the water overtakes the ship. For OceanGate, it would be something they could also charge a lot of money for, and they were going to need a lot of capital for what they wanted to do. Development on the Cyclops 1 was primarily focused on creating a template for an inexpensive sub that they could scale up quickly. The idea being that once they got this template down, they could just strengthen the hull for deeper depths. OceanGate seems to have taken a very iPhone-like approach to their submersible, focusing on sleek design and user friendliness. This push for functionality, simplification, and affordability resulted in some strange design choices. 
perhaps the most infamous being the sub's control system, which on the Cyclops 1 was a modified PS3 controller. Now, this has certainly been one of the most talked about aspects of this incident, and even before all this happened, it seemed to come up in every interview Stockton gave. We run the whole thing with this game controller. <laughs> come on! This was very much on purpose though, as Stockton himself would explain repeatedly. Oceangate really wanted to focus on the user experience and cost effectiveness above all else. They would cut cost on any component they could, getting interior lights from places like RV World and using off-the-shelf touchscreen monitors. They originally wanted to make a fully carbon fiber hull, but ran into design problems that we'll talk about more when we get to the company's next project. The Cyclops 1 debuted in 2015, and it was honestly a solid working sub. The company went with a steel hull, and it had a sleek design featuring an acrylic dome that offered an admittedly jaw-dropping view of the ocean, and was certified to work at depths of up to 1,600 feet. As of the making of this video, it has taken part in over 50 dives, and even helped research the wreckage of the Andrea Dora in 2016. It has been, by all accounts, safe, and has a good track record going for it. OceanGate even debuted a new launch and retrieval system that was the company's own design alongside of it. Rush and the rest of the OceanGate higher-ups were so thrilled with the success of the Cyclops 1 that they immediately laid the groundwork for the Cyclops 2, 3, and 4, with OceanGate proclaiming that the Cyclops 2 would be able to start expeditions to the Titanic in less than two years' time. However, producing a vessel to accomplish such a feat would be a very difficult task, and it appears OceanGate was not quite ready for it. The Titanic wreckage lies over 12,000 feet at the bottom of the North Atlantic. To explore an area of the ocean that deep requires the use of a deep submergence vehicle, or DSV for short. These are extraordinarily complex machines, designed to operate tens of thousands of feet below sea level and even on the low end, cost tens of millions of dollars to build and maintain. OceanGate decided to fast track this though, and pushed to have the Cyclops 2, renamed to the Titan in 2018, out and fully operational in less than three years. If you're already seeing the multiple ways this could go terribly wrong, well, buckle up because it gets a lot worse. Rush often spoke about his belief that most research submersibles were over-designed in that an equally capable vehicle could be achieved with much less expensive components. In creating the Titan, they kept with the theme of a sleek interior design, using a modified Logitech controller for the sub steering this time, off-the-shelf touchscreens, and basically taking all the shortcuts they had on the Cyclops 1. The problem is, once you start getting deep into the ocean, the last thing you want to do is cut corners on things like electronics. You need to make sure that everything you're putting into a submersible is rated to work at such depths, and won't do something like spark a fire, which will quickly turn into an inferno in a pressurized subcabin. For this and many other reasons, the process of getting a commercial sub certified is much more rigorous than it is for a more shallow water sub. Stockton, though, wasn't exactly a fan of these regulations. Because of this attitude, OceanGate didn't bother getting an independent review of the Titan during its development, instead taking an approach of we know best. And since the Titan was going to be diving to the wreck of the Titanic, which is in international waters, they weren't forced to abide by the regulations of any one country. What seems to have been the fatal flaw in the Titan's design, however, began as soon as the sub was being built. When creating the Cyclops 1, OceanGate went with a steel frame for their pressure chamber, but it wasn't their first idea. Having been a part of the aviation community for a number of years, Stockton really liked the idea of a carbon fiber hull. Carbon fiber is a very strong material that is regularly used in airplanes and has become something of a wonder material in the aviation world. However, its potential use for deep sea exploration seems to be more dubious, with many experienced members of the submersible community saying it is more of a risk than it's worth. 
no carbon fiber sub had ever reached the depths the Titan would be attempting to go, and the gold standard material for DSVs was titanium. Titanium, though, is expensive, very expensive, and carbon fiber by comparison is much more affordable. For a company obsessed with scaling up quickly and making a fleet of subs that can travel the ocean floor, being able to create one out of carbon fiber would save a tremendous amount of money. The issues began as soon as testing started, though. Initial tests done with a scale model of the carbon fiber hull resulted in failure at around the 3,000 feet of depth mark. To solve this, OceanGate engineers came up with the idea of placing titanium end caps on the Titan and adhering them to a carbon fiber hull via a strong epoxy. This, however, was an extremely ill-advised workaround. When you're talking miles deep into the ocean, you don't just have to worry about the water pressure, but the temperature as well. This combination of cold temperatures and water pressure affects materials differently, and it is a lot easier to control and plan for that when your hull is one solid piece of material, such as a titanium sphere. OceanGate ignored this and continued full steam ahead with the project, rushing out the Titan as fast as possible, as the Titan's own engineers even admitted. <laughs> I saw there was a lot of pain to get here. We did this extremely fast. You might ask why the engineers designing the sub would do this. Why take part in something so obviously rushed with so much potential risk? And the answer lies in a very revealing statement Stockton made in an interview saying, When I started the business, one of the things you'll find, there are other sub operators out there, but they, they typically um, have uh, gentlemen who are ex-military submariners, and they, you'll see a whole bunch of 50-year-old white guys. Um, I wanted our team to be younger, to be inspirational, and I'm not going to inspire a 16-year-old to, to go pursue marine technology. Some commentators have used this statement to argue that the Titan disaster happened as a result of OceanGate being too quote-unquote woke, which is an actual opinion real adults have in 2023, apparently. But taken in its entirety, it's pretty clear this is Stockton saying OceanGate prefers younger engineers, and this makes complete sense. A 20-year veteran of the submersible industry who has worked at multiple companies and knows how things are supposed to be done isn't as likely to go along with your plan of cutting corners and using potentially unsafe materials in the name of innovation and scaling. A 25-year-old fresh out of college who is using your company as their foot in the door for their career and hasn't had the same level of field experience is going to be much more agreeable. That isn't to say no alarms were raised, though. It was revealed in a court filing in 2018 that a former OceanGate employee by the name of David Lockridge had been tasked with inspecting the Titan and assessing whether it would be capable of diving to its intended destination. After examining the prototype sub, Lockridge determined that there were multiple issues with the vessel, specifically the carbon fiber hull and the way it attached to the titanium end caps. Lockridge thought the design would be unable to hold up in deep sea dives and expressed concern over how OceanGate would track the changes to the hull's integrity over time. The Titan was built with an acoustic monitoring system that would alert the operator if something with the hull started to fail. However, Lockridge was concerned that such a system would only detect a problem seconds before a catastrophic failure. According to Lockridge, OceanGate's engineers were extremely combative with him during this inspection process. Lockridge sent several emails addressing these concerns to Stockton and the management team. Suspiciously, Lockridge was terminated soon after by OceanGate, with the company even filing a lawsuit against him a year later, claiming breach of contract. Lockridge would file a countersuit in 2018, in which he detailed everything that I just listed off for you. But judging from this story, it's pretty clear that Stockton and the rest of OceanGate's leadership had little tolerance for dissenting voices. Hi, my name is Stockton Rush. I'm the CEO and founder of OceanGate. Let's take a look at Titan. So we're coming into the sub. This is the only toilet available on a deep diving submersible. 
best seat in the house. You can look out the viewport. We put a privacy screen in, turn up the music, and uh, it's uh, very popular. We have our uh, control screen here, our sonar screen here, and we can put any image we want in the back. The Titan's design was publicly the pride of Ocean Gate, with Stockton ranting an interview after interview about how safe and strong it was. However, warning signs were present from the very beginning that the Titan posed significant risks. The initial test haul had to be scrapped just before the Titan's original launch in 2018 due to having weakened from multiple dives and no longer being suited to reach the depths needed. In any other submersible company on the planet, the Titan's entire design would have been scrapped and sent back to the drawing board. Ocean Gate was not so cautious. The company was in a precarious situation, as they had already started offering pre-bookings for rides for over $100,000 a seat, a price that would more than double to $250,000 by 2023. Despite the 2018 setback, they managed another $18 million in funding from future customers. However, some customers started to become concerned. One such person was 61-year-old marketing entrepreneur and adventurer Chris Brown, who decided one night while he was having a beer with a friend that an expedition down to the Titanic sounded like a fun idea, with both guys putting a down payment and committing to the trip. However, after seeing the construction of the sub in person, Brown decided that he was pulling out. The buddy Chris had made his plans with, though, Hamish Harding, wouldn't be so fortunate. The company sold the Titanic trips not as some cheap theme park ride, but a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to work alongside a research team studying the Titanic wreck. This attracted some very seasoned experts, who'd spent decades studying the Titanic and were among the most qualified in the world to work on that sort of project. Chief among them being Paul Henry Nargelet, one of, if not the most well-respected expert in the world on the Titanic. I wasn't able to see exactly when he joined Oceangate, but they were very proud to announce they were working with him, and the fact that he joined at all showed the company's work was attracting even the most esteemed Titanic experts. No matter what you thought of how the Titan was built, if there was anyone on Earth you would trust to pilot it down to the Titanic's wreckage, it was Paul Henry Nargelet, which is exactly what he was doing on the morning of June 18th, 2023. With a sub that was supposedly ready, Titan's launch would be delayed one more time until 2021, when Ocean Gate had its first commercial dive to the Titanic. These first few dives were very exclusive, with early backers and news reporters being the first ones offered seats. But to hear a recount of them from a friend of Stockton's, there were some troubling signs early on. The first dive, Stockton did himself, and he heard the carbon fiber making cracking sounds, and he told us all before dive number two to be prepared for that. And while we were down there, uh, he actually let me drive, and I uh, feel a little bit, you know, he wanted me to be in control of my own destiny, not that he was, he knew there was risk involved at that stage. And at one point, I was actually even able to drive the submarine towards deeper water by the sound of the cracking getting louder. Then came June 18th, 2023. The group together on the Titan that day was brought together by a very unfortunate fate. Hamesh Harding was a wealthy entrepreneur from the UK who'd taken up adventuring over the last couple of years. In that time, he'd traveled to space, dived to the bottom of Challenger Deep, and invested in a project to reintroduce cheetahs back to India. He comes across as a genuinely good guy who'd probably be great to have a beer with which is exactly what he and Chris Brown were doing when they originally decided to join the Titan dive. As we said, Brown backed off having questions about the sub's safety, but Hamesh ultimately didn't. The final two passengers on this fateful day were Pakistani businessman Shahazda Daywood and his son Suleiman. Daywood was a Titanic enthusiast and had dreamed of going to see the wreck as soon as Ocean Gate announced they were doing tours. 
His 19-year-old son Solomon was the apple of his eye, and the boy loved his father just as much. So much so that, according to family, despite having personal reservations about going along for the trip, Solomon did so because he didn't want to disappoint his father on Father's Day. So here it is, on this morning you have five men bound by fate, who would ultimately share the same watery grave as the ship they had gone searching for. After four days, the remains of the Titan were found 1,500 feet from the Titanic wreck. Coast Guard officials said the debris indicated a catastrophic failure of the pressure chamber, and all indication is that the carbon fiber hull suffered a deadly implosion. The Coast Guard announced their findings and said the search for the Titan had changed from a rescue mission to a recovery one. No official cause as to why the implosion happened has been determined either, but given what we know about the sub, we can make some pretty educated guesses. Whether or not there is any legal fallout from this remains to be seen. There was already a pending lawsuit against OceanGate from a couple claiming they had paid for a trip they later canceled but weren't given a refund they'd been promised. However, they announced in the wake of Stockton's death they would be dropping this lawsuit. I'm going to leave things off here for now, but look for a follow-up video at some point in the future once the investigation and the fallout from that investigation is entirely settled. To me, the tragedy of this story is just how preventable it was. Ocean Gate's unwavering confidence in the Titan's design had them so focused on the future, it seems they completely ignored the lessons of the past, despite the fact they were literally staring right at them.